Hey friends, I am here today with a super special guest who is from all the way across the world. And we're going to dive into that in just a little bit, but I wanted to just give a quick introduction about what we're going to talk about. You all know that I talk a ton about personal branding and that your personal brand is what other people think, say, and feel about you and your personal branding is the way you communicate, what differentiates you from everyone else in your space, what makes you unique and how you serve your clients, your why, all of those important things that truly differentiate you so people can see why they should work with you, why you are the perfect fit for them versus someone else in the same space. And then your brand identity are those assets, those beautiful things like your logo, your color palette, all of those things that can resonate with your ideal audience to help them feel a sense of comfort and trust with you and see that you're cohesive across all of your platforms. So that's what we're diving into today because I'm not an expert in that area, but I love to talk about it and I'm super excited to have Elizabeth here with me to tell us all of these important factors that we need to consider when we are deciding on our brand colors and our logo and all the beautiful components of our business that help us become recognizable and memorable along with differentiating ourselves. So without further ado, Elizabeth Evrianava. I don't think I said it right, but I tried. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Robin Graham show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. I'm excited to be here. And it's Elizabeth and even it's very difficult to say, but Elizabeth Averianova. Even my husband uh, says I don't say it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's a beautiful actually when you say it correctly, but mm -hmm. I just don't have that tongue to to do that. Plus we just met. Maybe if I had practice for a while I would be able to do it. But anyway, Elizabeth, please tell the listeners I I would love for you to tell them about your journey, how you got to where you are today and also share with them where you live and how you arrived in this this incredible location and mm -hmm. what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm Elizabeth, I'm a designer and I have a background in architecture, classical architecture specifically. And I, many years ago, I, I graduated from uh, University of Notre Dame and which I loved the experience. And I had the experience during that time of studying architecture and design abroad in Europe, specifically in Rome, in Rome, Italy at that time. And I fell in love with it. I love Rome. You know, I fell in love with the European culture and after I graduated, I, in, my, in the back of my mind, I was like, I, I need to go back. I need to, I love it. I want a way to go back. But indirectly, long story short, basically, I met my husband. He's from Europe. And shortly after we got married, I booked a one-way flight to his country, to Europe, to the tiny country of Latvia. And that's in Northern Europe, a tiny little country. And so I booked a one-way flight. And at the time, I thought I might stay here a few months. And I thought we would go back to the U.S. Some things happened and we ended up not going back to the U.S. And at, around that same time, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with my life? I'm here. I didn't have a job. I just came here for, for love, basically. <laughs> and that was the start of my entrepreneurial journey as well. At the same time of this like grand adventure. And so that, that led me to search online. I have design skills. How can I use my design skills to, to make money, to make some kind of living? Or at the same time, I was looking for a job, but it just wasn't aligning at the time. And basically that was the beginning. Of, we started getting our first clients in design and architecture on, through the internet. And, and that was 10 years ago now. Wow. And so you don't only work with the architectural industries, like you're doing things for coaches and entrepreneurs and really helping them build that, the foundation of their business to help them become recognizable in the industries they practice in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so architecture was the early start of our business. And that was a focus for the first seven years. And then I shifted and I'll say evolved into offering branding and web design services, specifically for female coaches and online female entrepreneurs. And it was like an evolution that happened at that time, because I was starting to just learn about the coaching industry, the online coaching industry, and just started, I loved it. I, 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 grew myself a lot through personal development coaches that I came across. And from that, I was like, I could really combine these two things. I could combine 
the, my design skills and my love of building an online business, because that's what we had been doing for so long. And I can help other entrepreneurs build their online business, but through beautiful design. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. So I'm excited to talk about this because I love, I love when I see, it just moves me when I see a beautiful logo or a beautiful color palette. And I wonder like, why did they choose that color? Why was that? What were they trying to convey? And is it what I'm feeling? So let's talk about that. When you were looking to create your brand assets, when you're looking to design a logo, when you're looking to choose colors, I I always use the exercise with my clients if they're going to be choosing colors to go on Pinterest and create like a color palette and mood board where they choose colors and they choose different logos that they like to feel, but choosing those colors. And sometimes it's the sunset. Sometimes it's the sea, sometimes architecture, but things Mm -hmm. that move them and inspire them. And I love seeing what they come up with. I'm not doing brand design like you are, but when we have our, some of my clients I'll work with my designer and we'll do these exercises and I'm not an expert in it, but I love to observe it. So I would love for you to talk to us about today, the, like the critical things to consider when you are getting ready to design your logo, choose your color palette and all of those yummy things that go along with our businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The Pinterest exercise is such a great tool. And I do love that one as well. And it tells so much intuitively about the person. And there is a step that happens before that. So like the three critical things you should think about before that are really who are your ideal clients? Who are you serving? Because what you might like a certain colors, but will that color palette attract the kind of clients you're trying to serve? And if there's a disconnect, then it will not help you when you're trying to make sales and trying to book clients and trying to grow your business. So really understanding who is your ideal client, that's a big one. Uh-huh. And then understanding your goal. What is your big business goal this year, in the next year, and the next five years? So that's an exercise I do with my clients as well, which before the Pinterest one, which is just really understanding what are your business goals? Because I'm, I, even though I'm the designer, like I really need to understand that. So we say, what is our direction? Right. And you know, and get more specific, what are you going to launch in the next six months? And how do we pivot and and, um, design what we're doing to help that launch goal succeed? Mm -hmm. So that's a good, that's a good exercise as well. And then I, I guess the third thing is just really understanding that it takes time to evolve your brand and build your brand. And if you've been doing something up to this point and, and it's not really working, it's okay to totally break from that. So just, so that, so it's like a, just a tip of having the confidence to, to tr- try a new direction. I, I love branding. that. Cause it does take a lot of confidence to, you hear the word pivot a lot, but to rebrand or to shift gears and, and go a different direction. And that's the reality is not everything will work. And we as humans tend to evolve. So we may think that our ideal client is X, Y, Z, but then when we actually sit down and do these exercises, we discover that, oh, there's more to that. And so I love that you start with who it is that people want to work with. And I absolutely love, and I think it's so incredibly valuable to see the goals in play first too, because if you know who your ideal client, your soulmate client is, and then you know what your goals are, you can reach them so much easier than Mm -hmm. if you were just choosing something. Okay. So now we have those first three things. Love it. So this is where the Pinterest is a great tool to to, but as you're doing it is take a moment. If you're in the process of rebranding, just the Pinterest exercise, what we're talking about is you go on Pinterest and find images that really reflect who you are and represent you, but tie it to your ideal client as well, because sometimes there's a disconnect, but you want to make sure that they're compatible. So you go on Pinterest and find pictures of architecture, interiors, colors, like website designs already that have graphics on Pinterest, all, all these kinds of visuals. And organize that and you'll start to see patterns and, or you should start to see patterns. Sometimes once in a while we get a client where there's not really a pattern and it takes a lot of, we have to dig deeper in that, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great um, next step. Then from there, if you're working, what I do with the Pinterest is, is a combination of intuition and strategy and intuitively understanding 
the person and researching the person. So going beyond just Pinterest, I, I go and research their Instagram. I go and research everything I can find about them online and get to know the person. And then I need to also understand who is that ideal client. So researching their ideal client, making sure I understand what that looks like. And from there, that's, it's a combination. So it's hard to articulate, but it's like intuition and just understanding these kinds of things, but also tying it into strategy and tying it in also to theory, which relates to like art theory, architecture theory, like understanding typography, understanding colors and color psychology and these kind of technical topics. And that's coming from somebody I've, I'm trained as a designer. You know, I studied it in university. I studied it before then. And so that's, it's combining all this like technical knowledge with intuition. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit because I love color psychology. Every color has a meaning and every color will trigger an emotion in someone else or yourself. And so tell me a little, let's talk a little bit about that because I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize, but yet it, it really can be critical in terms of how you connect with your ideal audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So color psychology is huge. You know, what the feelings that are, that come out of certain color schemes, let's say it, it can really impact the person's decision on whether they want to work with you or not. And people are drawn to very neutral tones and very calm tones, or a lot of people are drawn to a more fun palette with like pink, like soft pinks or pinks mixed with like ocean teal blues and this kind of like more fun, a little bit beach vibe feeling. And let's just say you're going to attract very different clients with these two directions. Mm -hmm. And you could go on with examples, but just those two, you will attract very different people if you're more like neutral or even like black and white, minimalist, neutral tones versus like the, the fun beach, beach feeling, sunset feeling, just totally different audience. And you've got to keep that in mind as of who you're trying to serve. From my own experience, like I, as a designer colors, I sometimes I live in a very, like, if you see my office, it's like very black and white. It's very mm -hmm. minimalist. It's, my home is also all white, like very minimalist. And, but the reason is that for me as a designer is I need space to think I need space to absorb all of my clients different ideas and color palettes and styles. So I like white walls and things just to leave space for myself to think and regroup and really dig deeper on my clients with the yeah. colors. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. I love this, how you use the three, like neutral colors, the black and white, just very simple. And then the beachy colors. And you see a lot of coaches with pink and I'm guilty. I love pink. Like it just, it's a happy color. And I think it just lends to being approachable and all those things. But tell us a little bit about like the, the, the people that are attracted to the more neutral palette versus the black and white versus the more beachy mm -hmm. type fun colors. Yeah, definitely. Like for what, for one example, we had a client where initially we did a beach feeling and with a beach sunsets type of color palette because she lives in Florida. She lives, she goes to the beach every day, does yoga on the beach every day. But then the realization that her ideal client was actually corporate level clients doing corporate wellness. And you know, the people who are the decision makers in those businesses, maybe they like to go to the beach as well, but probably not going to attract the right kind of decision makers of, of this kind of palette. So we ended up just totally shifting the direction to the neutrals, the neutrals example, and just taking all that like bright color out of it and just going much more neutrals. And that will, that attracts those types of decision makers in those corporate positions for big companies. And that's a big thing you have to think about. So mm -hmm. yeah, who likes black and white? We are, yeah, our branding is like neutral and black and white, but we have a touch of pink and I love pink as well. <laughs> I love like the muted pink tone and mm -hmm. we, uh, or millennial pink, as they say. And that for us, that attracts females, even if we're more black and white sometimes, but the pink feeling we attract female clients and that's our dream client. There's the perfect connection there. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, so pink speaks to people, but then I've also seen red and, and other tones and red is such a power color. And I think that it probably attracts people that are 
very high achieving and just really strong and, and not going to let anything get in the way of their goals. So it's funny. I, I love to think about color psychology. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about topography. What do people look for in topography? Cause I think that is one, a lot of people don't have an understanding of why the fonts they choose is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Typography is my, one of my other passions. I love all these topics, but typography is a funny thing. And the biggest mistake that I see with typography is people are, are using too many different types of fonts on your Instagram posts. I see the font, different fonts on this post. And then a couple of weeks later, I see totally different fonts. So that's the biggest mistake I see is people are using too many fonts and people are using, and, and people are being inconsistent about those fonts. Mm -hmm. uh, but typography, it, it does matter because if you have certain fonts that are much more serious, much more um, professional, let's say, uh, much more reserved. And in general, I'm thinking um, of serifs fonts. That's a technical word, but like serifs fonts is like Times New Roman. That mm -hmm. I think we all know this one. Times New Roman. It's a certain. It has a much more traditional feeling. And if you are a more forward focused, like edgy brand or more like modern vibe, then this traditional font doesn't, might not feel right. If you are like a more fun, relatable brand, you want to think about a font that's softer feeling. So there's certain fonts that are more like a little bit more rounded feeling and not like hard edge and straight edge. And so the softer, so for example, we have a client where she has a much more relatable brand. We chose font, we chose fonts that were, had a softer feeling, like more curved feeling. Mm -hmm. It's hard to describe fonts verbally. Right. It's such right. a visual thing. But you have but... the, the ones and it's, you've got the serif and then you've got the sans serifs. And I think the sans serifs are a little bit softer, more feminine. They've got a little mm -hmm. bit more curve to them. And mm -hmm. then there's others too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you the, have the frilly script and all those things too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the script fonts, I love the script fonts. They are overused. Okay, fine. <laughs> but the script fonts, the biggest thing with that is you want to still make sure it's readable. Yes. Or if it's not readable, just make sure it's like not such an important word that you're using it for, but it's a decorative feeling. It gives a really good, nice, elegant, feminine, elevated feeling when you're using a beautiful like handwritten script font. Mm -hmm. And that's attracts certain, also certain types of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, but the key is, I just want to emphasize that when you choose a font to be consistent and you said that, and you want all of these things to be consistent from your website, all the way through your social media, your emails, anything that you put out. So people really truly get a feel for who you are, because it, as, as silly as it may seem, it really does influence the psychology behind someone working with you and choosing mm -hmm. you. But that consistency is key for building recognizability, memorability, and trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, if you're, so just to, maybe I can relate this to like a practical tip for people uh, is if you're trying to choose your fonts and a great way to discover fonts is go to Pinterest again and look up font pairings or like Google font pairings or just font pairings. And it will give you visually like great fonts that work together well mm -hmm. and that can give you a start that can start to give you ideas of, okay choose these two fonts and stick to them and mm -hmm. use that in all of your visual assets yeah absolutely and then do you have tips for logo design and what people should consider when coming up with a logo logo design is a big topic the the biggest thing is it's for me, the logo is not as important as you think. <laughs> you do want a logo, but I see too many people get stuck on when they're trying to launch a business and they think, okay, the next step, I need to come up with a logo and then all these other steps before they even have like a specific offer or a specific service that they're trying to give. They, they want to do the logo first. And even early in my business, when I had some other business ideas, that was all, like, I was getting stuck on making this logo as well and making the same mistake. And you spend so much time or you get stuck for months on it and you don't move forward in your business. So logo, it is important for, for consistency and putting it everywhere and for recognition. But I think there's so much emphasis on it that, um, that it's in the end, it, it's not the thing that's going to 
get, get a client to sign up with you. Exactly. And I think that the other thing I want to say is I'll see people use their logo for their profile picture or their, mm. their logo is on their website and the homepage, but you don't see who they are. And if you are a coach, if you are an entrepreneur, you need to represent you as the personal brand. Like people aren't going to have an, well, they may have a slight emotional connection to a logo, but the true emotional connection is going to be with you. So if you're using a logo for your Instagram profile picture, for example, people aren't going to know who you are. And especially if you are someone who is using photos for testimonials, using photos of your clients, using photos as a photographer, people will be confused as to who you are if you don't have a profile picture. So it's really mm -hmm. important to consider that you want to build that emotional connection first and foremost, so that you can build connection, build relationships and build trust. And you can't do that with a logo alone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Most of us are trying to build a personal brand. We're, we're not trying, we're not trying to build a huge entity that's faceless. Mm -hmm. like we're, we're building a personal brand around ourselves. So showing your face is, is really more important than, than showing your logo in, in various ways. And that's my personal take on the logos, but showing your face. Yeah. In the profile photos and in your profile in general, and on your website is really going to help people relate to you so much better. Yeah. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. And I, I think it's interesting because you work and design, you work with and design Kajabi websites. And I have always had a WordPress website and the woman that I work with and we work with our clients on it, she, we do WordPress and I know WordPress in and out and I love it for that. But I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about Kajabi and why that is your, the platform that you use just as a compare and contrast. Absolutely. I also love WordPress. I have been using WordPress for 15 years. I just, I love it, but I do not offer it as a service currently to clients. And there's different reasons for that, but I know WordPress also inside and out. I like building my own sites on WordPress. It, it's very technical platform. You have to either have somebody who is very supportive of you. So the designer also knows WordPress in and out. They can support you with technical issues and you know, building all the plugins and building the pages and everything. But if you're not tech savvy, then I've seen too many people like get overwhelmed by their WordPress site or they ha have an issue and it just takes three of their days, three days to fix the issue and they don't really know how to fix the issue. And uh -huh. it's very overwhelming. <laughs> so I think for a lot of people who are not tech savvy and, and also not even design savvy, Kajabi comes in as a great tool but it's more than just that. It also depends on your business model. So I don't think Kajabi is right for everyone either. Just like WordPress is great for a lot of people, but it's not right for everyone. It depends on your business model. And so Kajabi is really great if you are building um, online courses and online membership and certain types of coaching programs. And that's the main core of what, if you're, if that's the basis of your business, then Kajabi could potentially be a great solution. So that's always, again, why I look at the goals of, of somebody and okay, is Kajabi the right platform for you? Or is one of these other ones going to make sense? And yes, on WordPress, I know you can build courses and memberships too. I just think it's so technical for, it's too, too technical for a lot of people I work with. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that backend stuff. So mm -hmm. <laughs> for me, it depends like, on you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I love that stuff, but you're right. It can be very overwhelming. And you just said something that I'm curious about because you said online courses and memberships. So Kajabi is a great platform for, I've heard other people say that's what they use for their memberships. So you recommend that for memberships? Absolutely. We've built a lot of different memberships on it. You have to look at your membership structure and because memberships, they can be structured quite a few different ways. Mm -hmm. And that's again, where is the way Kajabi structures it? Is that, will that make sense for you? Or is there a different membership solution? One rare case, we've taken on some WordPress projects, but I said, we, currently we don't, which is one project is we, the way she wanted to structure her WordPress, uh, sorry, her membership, we, it, Kajabi was not working for it. And we took it off Kajabi and put on WordPress on a custom build WordPress membership site. And that it was made sense based on the structure. So it depends on your membership structure. Mm -hmm. And are there differences? Like what are, when you're talking about membership structure, like what mm -hmm. would that be like interacting with your clients more, giving them access to interact with each other and communicate and do different things versus just releasing modules 
periodically. Yeah, absolutely. So it depends. One was a recipe membership. So, so every month she was giving new recipes and new meal plans. Um, mm-hmm. And this was a health and fitness coach. And the WordPress has amazing plugins for recipe based businesses mm-hmm. that you have really beautiful recipes. It shows and really wait, great way to incorporate the vid- like the photos or the video tutorial. Mm-hmm. And it just WordPress really has great functionality with recipe businesses. So there's so many recipe blogs and they're all WordPress. Yeah. And I, I love looking those up too. So yeah, so, we just Kajabi launched a client not- who is, she's in the health, she's actually a gluten-free living coach. And so we just launched her site and it has the recipe plugin. Awesome. That's where WordPress is the probably the best solution for that. And that's where you took her off Kajabi, put her there, and she's got a really great functional uh, membership. And uh, WordPress is also great for the searchability of those recipes. Mm-hmm. So that that's her. That was her membership. Was every month she was giving recipes and meal plans to clients. If your membership was so, a different client, for example, is a fitness client giving res- sorry workouts every single week. And so the membership is new workouts every single week and, and as well as additional resources, trainings and things. And so Kajabi was a really great home for all of those videos every single week. Interesting. So So there's just so much out there now. Technology has changed and so many people have come up with remarkable ideas. And it's funny though, how like they're all different. They all think they're the best and they've solved all the problems, but yet they're None of them have, none of them are all inclusive for everyone. So it's just fascinating how complicated all of this is. It blows my mind. <laughs> oh yeah. All the tech tools, like which tools are right for you yeah. and which platforms are right for you for your course or your membership or your program. And yeah. it's, it does take time to research and test. And I just always recommend to test the platforms and get a feel of how it is, how it is working in that platform for you. If it's going to work for you, if something's overwhelming, then just know that there's another tool out there that might be better for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Back to these brand assets. What would you say to someone who is considering starting a business or rebranding their business and they have Canva and they're going to do this all themselves on Canva? Because I see this a lot. And I'm one of those people that I'm the first to hire someone because I want someone else's eyes and brain on what I think to make sure that clarity is there and that what I'm thinking makes sense, but also that I'm not an expert in all of these things. And I really want someone in my corner who is an expert because I know that then it's going to be top notch. It's going to be effective. It's going to really and truly work the way I want it to work. So what would you say to, and, and obviously some people starting out don't have the budget to, to hire someone, but I personally feel like we're not meant to do all these things alone. And I know my listeners have heard me say this a million times and I'm, I will always have a business coach. That's just who I am because I want a support system. I want like-minded people around me, but what would you say to people who are trying to do this on their own? Okay. I've been on both sides of this as well, where early in our business also, you know, I wasn't at the place where I could hire people and do things for me. And just now I I am in that position and I'm at the point where like you, I would rather just immediately, okay, I'm not going to waste my time figuring this out or spend my time doing this. Like time is so valuable and that's time you can spend towards so many other things in your business than something you're not good at or something that's not your zone of genius. And I'm also like the first, okay, can I hire somebody to do this for me and to save me the time? But okay, if we're not at that step and you're you're the previous step, again, I've been there. I know how that feels. You can DIY your brand. It is possible. Let's talk about Canva. Canva is an easy tool to use. It is a really great tool to use. It's addicting to search through all of the things available on Canva. And there's so many pre-made templates on Canva and they, they all look great. Even to me, okay, these all look great. There's so many ideas, but it's actually too overwhelming almost. I, I eventually just have to close the tab of Canva. And so it's an amazing resource to find templates for your social media graphics or your, or even your logo, or even so many resources that you need to make in your online business. But that's the the rabbit hole. That's, that leads you to the mistake where you start to not have consistency in your branding because, okay, you use this template, use that template, use something else. Okay. You make it your colors if you have chosen colors, of course, but they still don't feel consistent. They don't look good when they're all together on your Instagram feed, for example. Okay. What to do if you do want to DIY your brand is I 
first off, and you don't want to hire a designer is go to um, Etsy, actually go to Etsy or go to a great platform like creativemarket.com. It's, there's different design platforms out there where you can go and find a package of pre-made assets and you'll get us like a set of Instagram graphics, like a whole 300 templates of Instagram posts. But the thing is they all be consistent and they will all feel the same brand style. And that's a really great way to DIY it. It's very affordable to go on Etsy and find these kinds of things. And it's a great starting point. And of course, it's not at all custom to your, who you are, your business, your ideal clients, your goals, but it's a great starting point. Yeah, I like that. And, and there are people out there that have, if you're just looking for social media graphics, there are like content memberships and things like that. I know um, Audrey Wolf has the content bar. Allison Schulz has her set of, of content graphics and things that she puts out in her membership. There's a million of them out there, but yeah, great advice. All right, Elizabeth, this has been a fabulous conversation. I think we're setting people up for brand identity success in terms of knowing what's important and what they need to think about. I love the three critical factors, especially that we talked about at the beginning. So to, to wrap those up, that's your ideal client, know exactly who that is so that you know what will stimulate their interest in your brand and then your goals and the time. Time is such a huge factor. And I think I'm like way back in the beginning, I, I tried to DIY everything and I made so many mistakes and it ended up costing me so much more because the website it took years to get the website to where I wanted it. It took years to get the colors right and all these things. And I was constantly backpedaling it, which ends up costing a lot more money versus just investing up front. So I always encourage people that if you can come up with the money, try to, if you're not an expert in a certain area, try to hire someone just for that guidance um, so that you don't do what I did and have to backpedal and end up spending more and wasting a lot of time. Because I think those connections that your brand identity can help you make are very important from the get-go. Okay, Elizabeth, tell everyone how they can find you, learn more from you and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time is everything. Time, it, it, if you can get a brand identity built in a, a month or a, two months, then you are set to go for the rest of the year to launch your offers to grow your business and get yourself, you know, to the next level. And so I, I agree about the time thing. I just wanted to add that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you can find me on studioclassica.com. Um, that's our website, studioclassica.com. And I am active on Instagram and it's under my name, which is hard to spell, but Elizabeth Averianova. And it's, yeah, it's on Instagram is where I'm most active right now. Okay. And I will put the links to your website as well as your Instagram in the show notes. So people can easily head on over and follow you to learn more from you. And her designs are beautiful and she's got a beautiful little family. So definitely go over to Instagram and check her out. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here and listeners. If you found this episode helpful and you learned anything today, be sure and share the episode and tag us on Instagram. Also, if you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, you would melt my heart. I would be so grateful. That is how the show grows and we get more opportunities for excellent guests like Elizabeth, as well as that more people get to find and hear the incredible information to help them build their brands and businesses.